be that bad. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I am John Carney, and I am uh, the president and CEO of the Center for Practice of Bioethics, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the 24th Annual Planning and Lecture. Um, many of you know that this is a new venue for us. We are delighted and excited to be here. Uh, we have uh, been blessed with 23 years of, of um, hospitality from St. Joe Medical Center for many, many years. And this year, uh, had the occasion to be able to uh, relocate to the Jewish Community Center, and we are absolutely um, ecstatic about the welcome that we received and the opportunity, maybe, for us to develop this into a long-standing relationship. Um, we're especially delighted that uh, the particular reason for our, our reason to uh, gather tonight is to. Um, honor one of our, and to pay tribute to one of our most beloved teachers and mentors, Sister Rosemary Flanagan. So uh, hopefully the, the J, as I mentioned, uh, will become the, the uh, kind of home, and I think Gail has already mentioned to me that that is a particular um, affinity that they have is calling this home and I'm, I'm delighted that we're here and I hope that we can, we can rely on that invitation to uh, come to our second home again and again in the coming years. So as we do every year, we want to provide you an opportunity to recognize Sister Rosemary. Uh, you should have received a packet on your way in and inside that packet, um, you won't be surprised to find an envelope um, asking for your support. And we are um, particularly interested in you identifying the Bioethics Leadership Fund this year. It's a new uh, effort that this, the Board of Directors has established to um, basically provide support for young scholars and uh, older scholars, uh, some of us fit that category well, um, in the, both in the community and also uh, those that are pursuing um, additional education in the bioethics arena. So we're going to be uh, devoting our efforts uh, in the future to that as well. So. We would ask for you to uh, be generous with your donations and to honor Sister Rosemary in that way. This year in particular, uh, we want to make sure that we gather information on uh, how to stay in touch with you. So we have a good number of people who signed up who've never been to one of these before, um, particularly because of the topic that we're talking about tonight. And we don't want to lose track of you because this will not be the only time that we're gathering to talk about this issue. So uh, we brought, this is our third time already this year that we have uh, talked about this topic over the, the last 12 months, excuse me. Uh, Rich Payne, our um, John B. Francis Chair, your oncologist from, uh, from Duke University, retired Duke University, uh, began, kicked off this event um, in November of last year, right? Or October and November of last year, uh, talking about collision sports and, and, um, and football. 
And then we presented the idea to our board of directors in January and uh, had a very enthusiastic and uh, quite animated response <coughs> to the topic. And we've kind of adopted it now as an emerging issue. And so in, help me with the uh, date of the Bartholomew lecture, April, May of this year? Terry, do you remember? Uh, hey, you met, the Bartholomew lecture is every year. And we had a, uh, um, J.D., the lawyer, bioethicist, talked about the idea of um, a cautionary principle related to participation in collision sports. So that was our second, and tonight is our third, and we will begin to take a look at this issue more involving the community in the coming months, um, and possibly even over the course of the next couple of years. So um, this idea of uh, engaging the community is one that the center has been devoted to for quite some time, and we want to be able to continue that. This topic of collision sports, uh, potential head injury, um, improving safety, and providing good uh, evidence-based uh, prevention measures is important to all of us, and whether we're parents or sports enthusiasts or um, um, grandparents, uh, for many of us, who are taking a look at the, the risks associated with this, which we've learned about over the course of the last five to ten years or so. So we will uh, continue to not only look at the issues that are important to the people, the individuals who have a kind of a dog in the hunt here, but also to the uh, expanding body of knowledge and science around this topic, and so we'll be doing that over time. So right now, our eventual or hoped for outcome here is that we will be able to, over the course of the next couple of years, by engaging a whole variety of people across this community uh, in an um, outcome that, that we're really focused on is a robust and open, respectful discussion on how to effectively develop a modeled, informed consent process for athletes, for parents and families, and for physicians, so, you know, school uh, administrators in terms of guiding people through the process of what we need to be doing to make sure that we provide the proper protection and care for those who are engaged in athletics, especially the young people. Um, and in some of these uh, events, like in this particular sport, at a very, very young age, um, and exposing them to, to risks that um, we need to be careful about, certainly, and um, maybe more so than that. So in order for us to stay in touch with you, uh, those of you that are new to us, we need to capture your email address because uh, in many cases you may not have heard about this from our regular mailing list. So we've got some, um, no, or, uh, I guess some sign up sheets in the back. So if we've not got captured your email list, please make sure that we are able to do that uh, before you leave tonight so you can hear about these other, the, the other events that are coming. Um, I do want to mention that we are also hoping to uh, engage some new collaborators on this. American Public Square, uh, many of you may be familiar with their work in this community. We will be uh, working with them to create some of those venues and opportunities for us to talk about this, uh, in particular with uh, high school students. Uh, they would like to be able to have a, a serious discussion with them kind of as a, as a special stakeholder group that we engage uh, around this issue as well as many other groups that we're going to be doing. So um, watch for those uh, collaborative and, and joint offerings that we have <coughs> in the coming year on uh, some of the topics that we'll be talking about for, the, for this particular issue related to those uh, public groups. The other thing that I want to mention tonight before I um, ask Gail to come up and, and give us a, a welcome from the, from the J is um, in October, and I think you may have a little flyer or something inside the packet that you received. In October this year, uh, we also want to get your, your name and address so we can send you an invitation to join us for a film series that we will be launching uh, at the, the, the Tivoli uh, on three different, uh, what we consider to be poignant and, and pertinent bioethics issues. Gattaca, the film Gattaca, we'll be having some uh, discussions following these films at the Tivoli. The second one is Big Fish. Uh, which many of you may remember from, I believe, the early 90s or something like that, I think Early 2000s. Early 2000s. What? <laughs> early 2000s. Early 2000s. I'm dating myself right now. Okay. And then, uh, finally, the third one, which we'll do on October 
18. Will be um, the 200th anniversary of uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which uh, is probably the most um, important ethics film ever filmed. So. <laughs> Uh, a few years ago, uh, we began to also uh, capture this event using uh, closed captioning. And our good friend Chuck Monner at the time uh, provided that service until a, a very untimely and tragic um, illness uh, hit him a couple years ago. And uh, we have wanted to commit to continue to provide that service. So tonight we have Julie uh, Ensor with us from Tiger Court Reporting who will be capturing this for those of you that would uh, benefit from that. So I want to uh, welcome Julie and thank her for her participation this evening. And then finally, um, I want to make sure that we recognize our board members. There's a bunch of them here um, and former board members. So um, I don't know, I'm going to name everybody. So if you guys just want to stand and wave, and we've got some um, incoming, our incoming chair, there's John Borden over here, John Yates. Liza? Oh, yes, yeah. Okay. Anybody else? <laughs> oh, Alan. Alan, yes. Alan Edelman, who uh, was actually instrumental in our being able to, to, uh, to look in here. So, welcome. Well, and Sanderson, of course. Yes. Who could have Steve. Steve. I did see him. Oh, there. We've been trying to keep track of Steve. He's got a new job. <laughs> So and a number of, uh, obviously, Center volunteers also made tonight um, uh, possible, so we, we want to continue to express our thanks. So finally, uh, let me recognize Dale Levin, uh, who is the Chief Operating Officer for the Jewish Community Center, who has welcomed us with open arms, uh, provided great guidance in being able to uh, host tonight's event. I'd like to invite her to, uh, to come up, say a few words, and to, uh, for us to certainly express our appreciation to them for, for uh, your right to vote today. Um, so uh, as uh, you mentioned, I'm Gail Levin. I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at the J. Um, let me see a show of hands. How many of you have never been to this facility before? Wow. Okay. Um, of those that just put their hands up, how many are very surprised and had no idea what was here? <laughs> So let me also, um, I, it would be shameless of me not to put in some plugs. Um, so we do some incredible programming here. Um, and um, not only do you not have to be Jewish to participate, uh, which is a misconception um, that we have, um, but we welcome people of all faiths, backgrounds, diversity, and that's really what we're about. Um, and so we are thrilled to participate in this program this evening. Um, selfishly, partly because in your folders you may notice a postcard that looks like this. Um, so please take a moment and look at that. Um, we are doing, and, and actually Alan, you are at the center of everything, um, because Alan is also on the committee that is doing this program. We're working with the um, Command and General Staff College up at Leavenworth, and we we used to call it, internally, we called it an ethical cafe, but it's really going to be bringing 200 or so people together to talk about different topics um, in an ethics setting. Um, and so we were very excited about that and thought, well, if you're here tonight, uh, you might very well be interested in this program. So please check and make sure um, that you find that. It's on October 30th, so it didn't conflict with Frankenstein or any of the other um, <laughs> programs. Um, so I was glad to hear that. Um, and also, I, um, I just wanted to say from a, from a topic perspective, um, I, I had to kind of, uh, you know, when, when this came up and we were talking about it, um, I think that long before there was ever any research done about the impacts of football and collision sports, um, there was an entity that already knew this, um, and that was Jewish Mothers. So um, we did not, uh, many of us would never have allowed our sons to ever play football. Um, you know, contact was with a calculator and a 10 key. So, um, so I think we kind of had an edge on the topic well before anybody else. Um, and I was looking to see if Ruth um, 
Vegas was here because she was a Jewish mother that let her son play football in high school. So you are what they have. <laughs> you and, and Heinz and anyway. So uh, without further ado, though, I will, I believe, I am turning it over to to Terry uh, and enjoy. Um, I do have to put in one other plug, though. If you're enjoying our the closed captioning, um, we have one of the only theaters in town that does have performances that are captioned. So if you have any issues with either hearing or language or anything like that, please check us out um, because it is something very unique and we're very proud of it. So enjoy. I'm going to stand here, one, to try the microphone because we want you to use them uh, after the lecture. We'll have a Q&A and then I'll moderate. And also because I want Sister Rosemary to join me right here. We have an order of business to do. Those of you who come uh, for the 24th annual uh, Sister Rosemary Flanagan Lecture know that we need to have a greeting from Sister Rosemary and then a song. The first <laughs> greeting. I'm very happy to give a greeting. You people are absolutely wonderful. We've been doing this for so many years, and I was a little apprehensive talking football tonight, but now I'm getting, I'm not a Jewish mother, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> but I do welcome you all, and I hope that this association with the uh, Jewish Community Center goes far into the future. We are long-term people. I mean, you can come and stay, so you've got to be careful. <laughs> and the birthday girl. Would you join me in singing happy birthday to 92 years in three weeks? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Thing to be done 
in regard to what we know now and what we're learning and trying to learn. So what you need to know is that Dr. Miles is about doing the right thing and calling us to do the right thing. In addition to that, he is Professor Emeritus of Medicine and Bioethics, the former chair in bioethics at the University of Minnesota Medical School. He is an internist, a geriatrician, a beloved teacher, and uh, a, a, a an awardee uh, from the American Society of Bioethics and Humanities, where he served as president, uh, and also received their Distinguished Service Award, the Lifetime Achievement Award, along with Myra Christopher, uh, this uh, a year ago from ASV. She's received a Human Rights Hero Award and, and numerous other awards, uh, awards of that sort. He's published four books, uh, many chapters, uh, more than 200 articles. He writes about the Hippocratic Oath, one of his books is titled, Oath Betrayed, America's Torture Doctors. And his topic this evening is a controversial matter of public policy and practice regarding football and other fun sports. The good doctor asks if we ought to allow parents, if parents ought to allow their children to play football and other collision sports given what we're learning. I think this will be an interesting talk, and I think the dialogue that will follow will be uh, also fascinating, and uh, I'm looking forward to that. We will have a lecture from, from Dr. Miles, and then probably about 20 minutes for Q&A, which I'll moderate and ask you at that time to come to the, uh, to the microphones. Please welcome to the podium Dr. Stephen.
beliefs uh, are not making uh, public their participation statistics anymore. And this uh, past week, I went looking to get the new data on school participation and found that the group that has been keeping these statistics on easily downloadable Excel pages has now shifted to displaying uh, photocopies of Xerox pages meaning that you have to download each sheet and then copy some number off and then load it into an Excel sheet. Now why you would go from Excel back to paper, uh, I'll leave that to the brains in this room to figure out, but it seems to me you make data harder to find if you've got something to hide. Now, I'm going to use the term collision sport today. There are many sports where you can get a you can get a concussion riding a bicycle, and in fact, many people do. And in fact, there are more concussions coming into emergency rooms for bicycles than football. But people don't go out and ride a bike with the purpose and intent of having a collision every three minutes of riding. Okay? My brother maybe. But no other people <laughs> that I know, they wear masks. And when you get down to thinking about collision sports, which is different from a contact sport like ballroom dancing, a collision sport is designed to have a collision regularly and frequently in the course of play. And that brings you to American tackle football, rugby, boxing, mixed martial arts, and perhaps hockey, although the new checking rules on hockey have had a major impact, and so people aren't really sure about the status of hockey. You can have concussions with the cross, the cross. you can have concussions with cheerleading, you can have concussions with diving, but we don't set out to have a collision every time we play. Now, then the next thing that you have to look at is how many people play the sport and what is the concussion rate. I already mentioned that there's an estimate of about 4 million kids uh, going up through high school who are playing uh, football on both the school leagues and the non-school leagues. But here what you can see is the concussion rate has estimated for um, hockey uh, and football, uh, soccer and uh, soccer boys and soccer girls. You see the girls' concussion rate in soccer is a little bit higher, volleyball and so forth. But when you take the football, simply the football bar, what you can see on the football bar is that 50 times as many boys play football as hockey. So the comparable rate in concussions between the two sports is not comparable in terms of the number of concussions in that sport. And that's why football becomes a higher priority than hockey, even though the rates are the same for the two sports. Now the other problem with trying to study this, and it's really a problem for trying to study this, is that the dynamic of football is so exciting that the kids and the coaches underestimate the symptoms that the kids are having in the heat of the game, so they're not taking them out. All of us saw, for example, Cam Newton a couple of years ago. Here's a pro player, okay? He goes back to throw a pass. He gets slammed to the ground. He can't get up lying there. Finally, three coaches go up, and his buddies help him stand, and he's staggering around, and then this is what eight concussion experts are spread around the entire field watching this play, and they send him back into play, and he throws a ball wild, which is intercepted, and the game's over. Now, anybody could have seen that he had a concussion. There were people tasked specifically with that task, and they all missed it because of the excitement of the game. 
this happens in schools as well. And it happens in schools during games, and it especially is more likely to happen during practice sessions, even though, and practice sessions are much more common uh, than uh, game time, because the supervision of the field is lower, and the presence of the MTs of the, uh, during practices is much less common. And so these kids will get their headaches and their blurred vision and their not liking light after the game, the next morning. Saturday and Sunday morning when they're not in school, they'll be sitting in their room with their eyes closed because the bright light hurts them. And they may go to a primary care clinic. And so the concussion and the head trauma is not reported in relationship to game by an emergency department visit or an EMT seeing them, but rather it's, picked, it's talked about in a primary care clinic that gets associated with the game. Now, one has to, I hate getting into so much science, but I gotta, I'm going to have to go into science because you can't understand this without science. There's a traumatic brain injury which under the old language is seen as something as disrupting brain function and penetrating injuries to the skull, for example. And these people get long periods of unconsciousness or they die, and helmets actually are okay with preventing this because a helmet is basically designed to keep something from going through the skull and causing a skull fracture. And so helmets are okay for for this type of traumatic brain injury. But there's a subset of traumatic brain injury that is called concussion. And then below that, there's another much bigger subset. It's called subconcussive uh, injuries. And what this is, is there's a blow to the head, or there's a blow, say, to the spine that gets transmitted up to the head that shakes the brain causes symptoms. It's got to have symptoms to be a concussion. Now the question is whether or not the existence of symptoms causes a different kind of brain damage than the kind of brain damage that comes from this that has no symptoms. And unfortunately, the debate is focused on concussion that is symptomatic traumatic brain injury rather than asymptomatic brain injury because if a tree falls in the forest and you don't hear it, it doesn't make any sound. And I'm going to come to that in great depth later on. This tends to be a rapid onset, short life impairment, and it can last for hours. And it's generally felt that it has not caused uh, neuro, uh, it's largely a functional disturbance rather than an anatomical disturbance. But it wasn't really until we got the MRI that we could actually look at the anatomy of function in the brain. And once you can look at the anatomy of function, all of a sudden you start seeing a whole new world, the kind of world you see when you put on a skin diving mask and go underwater and realize, oh my god, there are fish swimming next to me, I'm getting out. <laughs> now, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, <laughs> here after CTE, to avoid dealing with damaged Latin, although I realize that the sister is completely familiar with Latin. <laughs> <laughs> Neurodegenerative disease, that is, it is a degeneration of the brain cells that is caused by repeated trauma, essentially building up a kind of a scar tissue inside the brain tissue. And this scar tissue is made out of protein called tau. You can see in those three slides at the top, you can see the progression of the deposition of the brown tau protein in brain, going from normal brain on the left to some tau in the middle to a lot of tau at the far right. You can see 
see that both in the cross section of the brain, and you can see it in the microscopic sections. Now, roughly, there's an older onset chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which has cognitive and motor impairments that tends to look more like, say, Parkinson's disease and Parkinson's dementia. But in young kids, you get behavioral and mood disturbances without Parkinson's symptoms. So it's much more of a psychiatric condition than a cognitive motor disease. Now, when you look at high school kids, and I'm only going to look at high school, I'm not going older than 18 here in this talk. They take anywhere from 200 to 1,900 hits. Oh, they had horses. That's a lot of ox to the brain, okay? And they are 20 to 180 Gs, okay? Now a G force is equal to the force of gravity, okay? The maximum one is 280 G force to the brain. And what has been shown is that three times as many kids have functional brain changes on the MRI as have symptoms. So if you are asking a kid, you have the symptoms of a concussion, you feel nauseated, dizzy, did you black out, blah, 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 blah. You're traveling at the top of the iceberg because there's a whole set of injuries that are below the water, you can't pick up because they don't make symptoms, but they're still causing brain injury. And there's this thing called functional MRI, which I'd like to talk to now. And what it is is it's a way of looking at the wiring of connecting the different parts of the brain so that they can speak to each other. Because you want to have all the parts of your brain communicate with each other. So you've got those gray cells on top, right? And they're tied by the white matter to the other parts of the brain, and that's why, or why I'm able to stand here and talk. Also, I didn't have any wine during dinner. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is an interesting study. Uh, this one uh, actually is a recent study. Uh, and the, the 2018 this year, actually. Um, and this showed that the tau levels increased almost 500% by, by postseason in athletes that had a high impact head injury compared to those who did not have a high impact head injury which actually is a fancy way of saying the kids who were asymptomatic. So the kids who didn't have any symptoms, their tau went up one and a half times. And for the kids who did have symptoms at the end of the season, their tau was up fivefold. And another marker was up, as you see, similar amounts. Now this is 16 kids. Not so many. And that's the problem because it's really expensive doing MRIs, especially a series of MRIs. Now this is a set of only 17 college and high school kids. And then they took batch control students who didn't participate in collision sports. And they used them to generate what does a normal MRI using this technique look like. And then the kids who had a concussive impact were looked at at one in eight days, and then they were looked at again, and this is the important part, six months after the end of the season. And what they found was that when you looked at the kids six months after the end of the season, you see those empty spots there going out to the cortex? That's where the white matter not communicating to the cortex properly. 
that's where there is edema and scar tissue, the top protein, is developing in the wires inside the brain. But this is not something you want to see six months after a football game. This is beginning to speak about a chronic injury. Now, this is kind of an interesting study. <clears throat> I told you I wouldn't talk about NFL players, and I'm not going to. But what this looks at is, if you take NFL players, and then you look at when they started playing, and then you look at the question of how bad is their brain injury, and you can divide them into two groups, the groups who started before age 12, and the groups who started after age 12. The NFL players in the under 12, who started before age 12, had more white matter damage than the ones who started after 12, suggesting that there is a, again, a time relationship to the number of hits. Now keep in mind, these hits, when you're playing in school level football, are 200 to 1,800 hits a season. So these 200 to 1,800 it's appeared to add up in this study. I suppose the question is, how many small studies do you need? Now, it's very hard, though, to count doses of head trauma or brain trauma. And so the cumulative head impact index identifies repetitive health head impact by combining self-reported things like number of seasons, uh, positions they play, and they take impact data from helmet accelerometers for those positions, okay? Not for the individual players because they weren't using accelerometers in their helmets. So you say, well, the average linebacker for this position has this kind of impact profile. What they find is that there is a threshold dose response curve that is the higher the cumulative health head impact index is, the greater the amount of late life cognitive impairment, and P equals 0 0.0019, which is roughly uh, one in, uh, the chance of that occurring is roughly one in 5,000 by chance. Okay, it's a really strong indicator that there's something really happening here. That the self-reported executive function, my brain isn't working normally. I left my shaving kit at home this morning. Um, <laughs> is 0 0.003, which is you know, way out there. A depression, 0 0.009. Apathy, 0 0.0040.
distribution scores and memory scores lining up in a row. Now, this has implications because why are these kids, what are these kids doing while they're playing football? They're getting an education. Yeah. We've sent them to school to grow their brains, mm -hmm. and we seem to be putting them into an environment that are preventing their brains from growing properly. So here's another one, and this looks at numbers of concussions, zero, one, and more than one, and a neuropsychocognitive uh, test of attention span. And what you see here is the one concussions, the attention span drops. And trails B is kind of a fun test. What this is, you can imagine something that goes um, what you do is you trace something that goes 1, B, 2, C, 3, D. Okay, so you've got to switch back and forth. That's what the test is. And what you see is that basically you should be able to do this easily. This is easier than a Sudoku. Um, <laughs> I've done this test. I've done Sudoku. Just take me as much as I what you see is the number of concussions, 0, 1, or greater than 1, trails the performance gets worse. Okay? This is like a real deal. They have, again, attention and concentration were down. So trails B is basically a attention and concentration test. It's different from the pure attention test. Now, GPA is also study, 2,600 high school students, uh, sports medicine uh, paper uh, 2018 or 2016. Um, and this shows a, um, a symptom scale which involved balance, dizziness, drowsiness, noise sensitivity, lethargy, fogginess, increased concentration and memory. What you'll notice is that those who have suffered from concussions uh, basically tend to pick up more and more serious intellectual deficits as the season progresses. Now, it's very hard to do autopsy studies on young people <laughs> because they don't die. <laughs> Concussive traumatic encephalopathy <coughs> is a disease which you can study with an MRI, but you can't, it doesn't, it's not lethal in kids. So what you have to do is you have to pick up kids who die of other <coughs> reasons. Car accidents, okay, house fires, suicides, that kind of thing, rather than on a football team. And then if you take kids who play football, what they found in this, this is the Boston Brain Bank, the six out of 26 high school players had anatomical concussive traumatic encephalopathy and went out to die from other things. That's, I thought these are just uncommon. But six out of 26 is a very big deal, okay? It's a lot of having scar tissue 
question comes up, can football be saved by modifications? Some people argue, uh, let's try new helmets. Well, a helmet doesn't really change the movement of the brain inside the skull, okay? And so some schools are now paying $1,500 for these fancy helmets, but they really don't change the physics inside the brain as the brain rocks back and forth on the brain stuff. There's no effect. The mean number and kind of concussion symptoms resolution time or return to play are similar between people wearing varieties of new innovative helmet designs and older helmet designs. Heads up tackling. The idea on heads up tackling is no headbutting and it gets tackled with their head out of the play. There's no difference in the concussion rate detected by trained sideline No, <coughs> and people keep recommending heads up tackling. Now you think if somebody wants to put a reform into play, they at least develop some evidence to validate it instead of saying, well, in theory, this should work. There's no evidence whatsoever to validate heads up play. It's like saying everything's all faster than light. We all know what happened. Galileo climbed the Tower of Pisa and dropped a heavy ball on a light bulb. Now, the reason I'm here today is I got so hurt at the American Academy of Pediatrics. Peter Cox, these are my colleagues, not in geriatrics, but Exemplary supervision should not undertake three of the sports at the pre adolescent level. 2010, young athletes, their brains are still developing. They may be more susceptible to the effects of the concussion. These people are doing pretty well right now, anticipating the direction of where the science is going to go. 2015, this is before the movie Concussion. This is before the discovery of. Uh, this is after the uh, initial papers came out on concussive encephalopathy. Removing tackling from football altogether would likely lead to a decrease in overall injuries, severe injuries, catastrophic injuries, and concussions. However, removing tackling would fundamentally change the way the game is played. <laughs> what? <laughs> These are my colleagues, okay? It's not their job to protect and entertainment industry, it's their job to protect its health. The lead authors of this paper had a conflict of interest. One of them was working in concussive, again, uh, collision sport. They made only passing reference to the effect of brain trauma on academic performance, which after all is the reason kids go to school.
sets are really liability waivers. Traumatic concussion may lead to abnormal brain changes, which can only be seen on autopsy, known as chronic traumatic encephalopathy. <coughs> Reports suggesting the development of Parkinson's disease, ALS, severe traumatic brain injury, depression, long term memory issues. Further research is needed on this before conclusions can be drawn. Now, there is a kind of consent. Okay? Uh, moms, if you took, there's a degree of risk in everything, and you took this consent, would it change how you look at what you're now, if I was writing a consent, it would go something like this. Repetitive head trauma, yeah, the football is likely to adversely affect pension memory, school performance for weeks and possibly long term. Coaches can't detect it. That's a true statement. Show me that. Brain damaging injuries often do not have the symptom of depression. The evidence is there to support that. School football is an unlikely path to college scholarship. In fact, now the data shows that kids are just as likely to get college scholarships whether they do football or not. And that the chance of a high school player going on to play on a pro team is one in 1,200, not 26%. And then furthermore, the average pro career is 3.3 years. This is a different construction of the consent, but this one happens to be based on the facts. Furthermore, the injuries and the chronic injuries, rehabilitation injuries, lost income, and then it's insured. Once you go on to school, you're going to in your cognitive problems, those are in your yearbook. But furthermore, you're not covered by health insurance in many cases. This looks at the number of kids playing football beginning in 2001. 2017, the 2017 season does not count at, is until the end of 17, so it's the 16 17 season. You can see football's got a problem. The data from last year is not yet available and won't be coming out until later in August. But as you can see, football, even though it's only down. From the peak of a million, it is definitely dropping. And we're seeing schools close teams, particularly rural teams, close teams. We're seeing teams that were so small where kids were playing both offense and defense closing. We're seeing teams shifting from 11 player teams to 8 player teams. In addition to that, care about this. They say sports concussions are a major problem. They don't want tackling to start early. Women oppose tackle football, which or not. <laughs> By the way, I work out at a J three times a week. We've got a gym here. We must have a gym. Just, yeah, bring in a plug for so Okay. <laughs> Well, they probably have reciprocity with some other chicks. Maybe. Maybe. You haven't talked to this. Talk to them. I have no conflict with others. <laughs> I don't think 
But I do think that we could close football programs in public schools, and we should do so. Because, you know, the point of school athletic programs is to create healthy, physically active lifestyles. People don't play football for their whole lives. They bicycle, they play tennis, they play golf, they swim, they run, they work out. These are the things that are part of a healthy lifestyle. To build this enormous infrastructure is something that people do not play. It is not part of a viable career path. It is supported at taxpayer expense and which damages the brains that the schools are, are supposed to be educated, strikes me as not a wise investment in public resources. But that's not calling for taking away the right to play football. It's not calling for closing down Pop Corner. You can go and take private piano lessons. You can go down to Berlitz and take private French lessons. I'm not proposing. And if you recall, Pop Corner, Football USA, these are three courses of football venues for kids in the state. So let's redirect the infrastructure of school athletic programs to things that make up a healthy life cycle. Kids don't spend their entire lives playing video games. That's it. <laughs>
said was that his basis of his arguments is incorrect, and that it is not factual science validated with rigorous studies that he's basing his conclusions on. Did you agree with that? Well, yes, I do, and let me tell you why. Because I think that if we do the proper studies, and we do longitudinal studies, and we were asked to design one for the NFL and the NFLPA Players Association. The difference between an association and causation. And it's incredibly hard in medicine to prove causation. Um, and it is incredibly easy to find false associations. On the other hand, the NFL did pay a lot of money to its, to its employees, team member, to its athletes, on a suit alleging that they were misinforming the athletes with regard to the risk of CTE, and that furthermore, that there was a, a damage done to those athletes that merited compensation. So to some extent, the NFL's actions, and this applies only to pro ball, it does not apply to school ball, to the young youngsters like I'm talking about. I think that the case with regard to uh, professional players really has been established in the high rates of CTE are seen on the autopsies of these adults, <coughs> and they do seem to be highly correlated with the type of football career they've had. The question I think where you and I would have a harder time is at what point does the evidence of an association become compelling for the earliest stages of a devastating brain disease? I would agree with you that the causal relationship remains speculative, but the evidence of associations between diffusion injuries being related being as highly associated with trauma and diffusion injuries being highly associated with measured declines on cognitive function testing is enough for us to protect our kids prospectively rather than to wait for more data to come. Uh, 
you know, if you were 175, 180 pounds, you were perfect weight. I think now the problem is that they're 250, 275, 300 pounds, and they run just as fast as they used to think I could run. Yeah. So it's the size and momentum. The size is different than it was 20, 30, 40. Yeah, there's certainly, your, your point's well taken. There's a formula I think Newton probably about was force equals mass times acceleration. Uh, and that applies to deceleration as well. So you got a 350 guy, pound guy versus a 125, you got a different kind of issue. That being said, I mean, you know, cultures can change. Boxing used to be a really big deal until about 1960 when a fish took the map and died in a subdural in Wisconsin. A Catholic boy, by the way, was a And um, they, uh, they, the NCAA closed on uh, uh, college intramural bat, uh, boxing uh, within that season. Now, at the end of the came back 30, 40 years later in a vastly remodeled way. Yes, sir. Are there any characteristics of the player that might help us to predict that this young person is going to get in more trouble, or if they already have had some? I, you know, there's rules about keeping them out and play yeah. again, but and, and serious, more serious problem, I can't play anymore for several of those, I can't recall the exact rules. But, but nonetheless, is there any cautious thing you can say for, I kid is everything 140% or do you just say, please these kids? Yeah, I, I, I find the data on positions to be very hard to understand, but the data on, um, if, a per, if a kid has a concussion during the season, they are at an increased risk of having a second and third concussion in that season. So it may be rather than working out a return to play, we should work out termination after one concussion. Um, I'm not a, I'm an insignificant football fan in the sense of understanding the rules of play that well, and so I'm not qualified to comment on that particular topic, but some of this data I'm repeating is quite disturbing. Now, so in this far, I'm going to be playing football, and I've always recommended me to ask my coaches in the school district to uh, protect me and other players that. Them, uh, them the opportunity. This kid is playing 
offense and defense. Considering the rapid growth of soccer here in Missouri, this guy has a future in soccer. And I watched that one cup. Those guys are super athletes. You know? All right, next. Just before that, Dr. Joe, Joe, do you have three bullet points for someone like that as to what he should do to try to? I do. I have. Um, the first is you need to be very careful about the sport you choose. You need a number of considerations that you as a parent and as a student athlete should ask and demand. Number one, are you age and size mesh? Number two, are you skill mesh? Number three, do you have educated, cooperative coaches to understand the problem? Number four, do you have athletic equipment that is fitted to you, maintained, and checked? Number five, do you have a proper attitude and do you go into the game uh, caring and knowing the rules and the brotherhood of sports? And number six, do you have good officials? And number seven, do you have proper medical care at all times during and after the game? And number eight, do you watch out for your brothers? No, a woman in orange, actually. Oh, he's my dad. Oh, he's your dad. Oh, he's your dad. <laughs> <laughs>
I talk about my uh, talk to this about my dad or uh, with my dad from time to time because he's a former football coach and also a football player. And um, so I was wondering about your thoughts. You said about the nanny state. You're not there yet. So I was wondering about your thoughts on the law that was passed in Illinois: no tackle football below 12 years old. Well, I, you know, the thing is that I see a difference between a law that says no tackle football before age 12 in the nanny state, partly because by going to flag football for the very young, like the under 14s, they can learn the various defensive and offensive formations, the moves, the skills of passing and pass catching and so forth. So I don't have a problem with that. Um, and they also get introduced to uh, wearing the equipment and having experience wearing the equipment, which if we are going to have football, I think these are all good things for people to have. Generally, most sports, having experience with the fundamentals of play is protective, okay? Me getting on a horse, dangerous from day one. <laughs> So I don't have a problem with those. I think that eliminating certain plays for the under 14s, like the cop returns, really is a, is a prudent step that we can take now. But in, in relationship to my colleague over there in, in critical care medicine, I do think that the association evidence is strong enough for now to move football out of public schools while additional data comes in and let individual citizens make their mind. But Make football illegal like uh, heroin just seems like uh, a bridge too far. <laughs> All right, we've got one minute left um, right here. You get the last question. Oh, God. Are you working for the NFL? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Harriet. I'm actually one of the two people that are Fabulous. These are all 
several team sports. You can play them. But you don't go out on your motorbike or you don't go out on your mountain bike to slam your head on the ground every two minutes of play. Unless you're really unusual at it. <laughs> <laughs> What we're talking about here is we're talking about the evidence that is mounted with regard to a subset of, of team sports that are called collision sports. And in this particular case, we're talking about the most popular collision sport in the United States, and that means the collision sport generates the most head trauma of any of the team, uh, team sports in the United States. So by all means, get out of school. Please get out of school and go ride a bike and play the meanest game of beach volleyball that you can play. Take up wrestling. Martial <laughs> arts. But football's a different, different kind of a game. Thanks for coming.